With the release of the Xbox Series X and PlayStation 5, the gaming world was introduced to the powerful Scarlet and Oberon system on chips. Based on AMD's Zen 2 microarchitecture, the CPU side of things is an incredibly impressive showing for Microsoft, Sony, and AMD, rocking 8 cores and 16 threads in all three current generation consoles. Even though this is an impressive showing of the technological might of AMD, this wasn't the first time a high core count CPU was featured in a home console. But the Xbox One and PlayStation 4 actually rocked 8 CPU cores when they were released back in 2013, giving developers 8 total threads to work with. This lines up nicely with the Intel Core i7 range, which for years also utilized an 8-thread design. While you didn't need an 8-thread chip to beat the consoles last generation, it was certainly a nice to have, and if you invested in an i7 all those years ago, chances are it's still incredibly capable in today's games and workflows. However, with developers now taking advantage of multi-threaded CPUs to a greater extent than we've seen before, are 16 threads the new requirement if you're looking to match the current generation consoles? It's a question I've been seeing in the tech community, and with that there are tons of options currently available that can satisfy your 16 thread desires, with the i9-9900K coming in at $330, making it rather competitive with AMD's Zen 2 based Ryzen 7 3700X. So if you're eyeing a PC upgrade and aren't sure where to start, let's take a look at the Intel Core i9-9900K and see if this chip is worth buying and how competitive it is with Intel's own lower-end parts. To understand the i9-9900K a bit better, let's pop the hood and take a look at the guts of the chip and piece together some of the decisions that were made to bring it to market. Starting off with a macroscopic view of the chip, we've got a fully unlocked Coffee Lake R die, a 14 nanometer plus plus refresh of the popular Coffee Lake line which was marketed as the 8th generation of Intel Core i-series processors. However, with the move to this larger 180 squared millimeter die, we get two extra hyper-threaded cores along with an additional block of cache both of which are what helps to bring the heat both literally and metaphorically. On a lower level we've got derivative Skylake cores, meaning that overall instructions per clock is similar to the previous three generations. To understand why IPC is mostly unchanged, we have to look at the individual core designs along with the cache structure. Within each Coffee Lake core we get 8 execution ports, as well as a 64 kilobyte block of L1 cache. When compared to the newer Cypress Cove cores, we get less execution ports and a smaller cache, though this does have its benefits, as the smaller block of cache means fetch times are reduced, meaning the core can get a hold of the data that it's requesting sooner, leading to less of a latency between the chip receiving the instruction and the task being executed. However, because we have less execution ports, that means that less logic is physically in the core, which is what leads to the lower IPC value when compared to the newer parts from Intel's labs. The core overall features less parallelism as what would be found in something like this, which means that the clock speeds have to be pushed higher to compensate for the lack of this extra circuitry. The L2 cache size is also smaller than what's found in Cypress Cove, with a 256 kilobyte block being used to feed the core. When looking at this chip at this low of a level, it actually draws striking similarities to the much cheaper i7-9700K, which while not featuring hyperthreading, has all the single-threaded horsepower that's found in the 9900K. Keep this in mind because I'll come back to the 9700K later down the line. What the i9 has over the i7 though is an additional 4 megs of L3 cache, bringing our total up to 16 megabytes on 16 lanes, which is shared between all of the on-die cores. This cache pipeline is actually identical to what's found in the i7-10700K, meaning that this chip has an overall similar amount of throughput as the i9 model that I've got right here. The 16 threads on this chip also really helps to keep it competitive with Comet Lake, and the overall cache structure allows for a smart programmer to easily take advantage of the strengths in terms of latency. Moving away from on-die memory, let's take a look at the clock speeds of the chip. With a rated single core turbo of 5GHz and a base clock of 3.6GHz, this massive variability in speed of your chip can be countered by a simple all-core overclock. But in this case it isn't really needed as my chip locked to around 4.7 GHz all core out of the box. An AVX offset is also recommended if you plan on overclocking, as this helps keep temperatures under control and lessens overall power consumption. Overclocking results will vary depending on the quality of the silicon in your individual chip, however mine was able to achieve 5 GHz all core at 1.272 volts. 
with an AVX offset of negative 2. I used a Corsair H115i and the chip stayed relatively cool. However, the 125 watts plus that this chip draws means that I'd recommend a decent motherboard, specifically ones featuring at least the Z370 chipset or ideally Z390. In my time with the chip, I've used both Z370 and Z390, and both chipsets allowed my 9900K to clock similarly. It's just important to keep in mind that a BIOS update will be required if you plan on picking up a board featuring Z370. This is also true with any 9th generation processor. This leads quite nicely into power consumption, which is reported in software at maxing out at 140 watts when fully stressed. However, in everyday usage, the power usually doesn't exceed 95 watts. But this is under a normal gaming workload where the CPU isn't being stressed as heavily. When sitting idle, power sat around 20 watts, which while not high, isn't exactly low when comparing to the newer Zen 3 based chips from AMD. Power does have the propensity to spike up on this chip occasionally, so I'd recommend a serious cooling configuration, consisting of either a large air-cooled heatsink or even a water cooling loop if you don't mind the hassle of setting up the thing when building your system. I found that my 240mm AIO was able to keep the chip under 80 Celsius during an all-core stress test, and the chip never thermal throttled or had to dial back clocks due to power limitations. Overall, this chip isn't as efficient as its AMD competition, but in the desktop market, it's really not that big of a deal as compared to mobile. What this all translates to is ultimately a warmer room and a slightly higher power bill. I think it's also worth noting that the onboard memory controllers come stock at 2666 megatransfers per second, but they overclock to 3200 and even 3600 megatransfers quite easily. This means more heat, but the increase in performance might be worth it if thermals aren't a concern. When compared to other coffee lake chips, this overclocking headroom on the memory controllers is relatively standard, and should allow the chip to be paired with almost any memory. It is worth noting, however, that the memory controllers seem to run into issues when clocked above 4000 megatransfers per second, so if you're eyeing one of those new blazing fast DDR4 kits that run at 5100 megatransfers, I'd advise sticking to around 3600 megatransfers, as the voltage needed to bump the channels to that speed might have a detrimental effect on the long-term viability of your chip. If resale value is important to you, an overclock to the cores isn't a big deal, but be careful with the memory controllers. Just a piece of advice that I learned the hard way, I would try to keep your memory voltages at or below 1.35 volts, as 1.4 has personally led to instability in the system I use on a daily basis. It also means your RAM has a higher chance of cooking itself, so it might be worth just investing in a 3200 mega transfer kit and calling it a day. The overall instruction sets on this chip are also the gold standard setup from Intel, However, there are some instructions missing when compared to the newer Cypress Cove. Most notably, AVX512 is absent, meaning that certain workloads requiring fused vector operations will be slightly slower, however the inclusion of AVX and AVX2 means that the chip is still able of executing said operations, just on a narrower bus. Virtualization instructions are also included, so if you plan on running virtual machines, this chip will do so gladly, and from my experience can handle two machines with ease while allowing for some light gaming on the host OS. The hyper-threading on board really helps keep this chip's performance up when it's multitasking, however the limitations of 8 cores might push the i9-10900K more into the limelight if you pair in doing some server work. In terms of PCIe, this chip features 16 generation 3 lanes, meaning if you're running an NVMe SSD, you're not getting a full x16 connection to your graphics card. This isn't really a big deal for the everyday gamer, however if you have multiple SSDs utilizing the PCIe bus, you'll be sacrificing bandwidth between your CPU and GPU. 8 PCIe 3.0 lanes should be more than enough to saturate a modern graphics card, but the overall interface may be limiting a gen 4 capable NVMe drive. I personally use a Samsung 970 EVO as my boot drive, and my system is beyond responsive and loads into Windows quickly, so for the everyday gamer, this is not really a deal breaker. This all brings us to the specifications of our test rig, and how we'll be testing our games to see how the i9-9900K performs across a variety of games. Utilizing an MSI Z390A Pro motherboard, we've got a rather capable and professional looking board with the VRMs that will allow the chip to draw as much power as it needs without running into issues or throttling. I've also paired the chip with 32 gigs of 2933 megatransfers per second DDR4 in dual channel. This is technically an overclock for the memory controllers, however with Intel chips memory speeds aren't as crucial as on Ryzen, meaning capacity is taking precedent over speed in this test suite. 
We're also running all of our games off of a Samsung 860 Cuvo to eliminate potential bottlenecks in our secondary storage, and are pairing the chip we're testing today with the GTX 1080. It's not the most powerful card, however for 1080p gaming it'll allow us to remove a graphics bottleneck from the equation. All of our games will be tested at 1080p on the lowest settings and will be run for 10 minutes, after which we record the minimum, average, and maximum frame rates achieved during the run. Without any further ado, let's dive into the games and see if 8 cores and 16 threads is really required to game in 2021. In a nutshell, the Intel Core i9-9900K is a beastly chip that brings 8 cores and 16 threads to the masses. While the chip itself is powerful on its own merits, in the current extremely competitive CPU market, is it worth picking up one of these chips if you're eyeing an upgrade? If you're able to find one for the right price, at or under $300, then this chip is an awesome choice, and will allow you to easily keep up with the current generation consoles in a technical sense. However, the i7-9700K provides most of their performance for a solid chunk of cash less, meaning that chip is much more appealing and much easier on the wallet. The newer i7 models from Intel are also slightly more appealing, as they offer identical specifications to the i9, including the cache structures, while coming in at a cheaper price and on a newer socket. Not to beat around the bush or anything, but the ever so popular LGA1151 socket will not be receiving new processors moving forward meaning that this i9 model is the highest end chip that's going to be available. If you're looking to buy this chip with a plan to upgrade later down the line, then that's not an option unfortunately, and it makes me more comfortable recommending the i7-10700K as it features an upgrade path to the 10-core 20-thread i9-10900K, and even a Cypress Cove-based 11700K. This also brings up pricing, which falls in favor of the new 10700K, which can be found for $259 at the time of writing on Amazon and Newegg, both of which offer an incredible deal considering the specifications of the chip. Keep in mind that for that price, you'd only be able to buy a 6-core i5 roughly two years ago, which is incredible considering how far we've come in such a short time. Sticking with the i5, it's also worth mentioning the newer i5-11400, which can be found for less than $200 and offers performance similar to the i7-9700K, while also being on LGA-1200 and offering a newer microarchitecture. The i5-10400 and 10600K are also excellent choices for gamers, as the 12 threads will allow for high refresh rate gaming, along with competent video and photo editing capabilities. The 10th generation chips mentioned also feature higher out-of-the-box clocks and die thinning, a technique used to improve thermals by a not insignificant amount. However, it isn't necessarily a deal breaker or maker. The i9-9900K, while being immensely powerful, 
also features so much power that a majority of it may not be used. Once again, leaning me towards recommending the much cheaper i5-10600K and the i7-10700K if video editing is a daily task. The i9-10900K though is still a bit pricey, and for gaming, 6 cores and 12 threads should be more than enough to power through all your favorite competitive games. The i7-9700K is also worth mentioning once again, as it offers similar performance in a lot of the games tested and comes in much cheaper, not to mention being compatible with the same motherboards as the 9900K. In conclusion, the i9-9900K is a powerful but pricey chip when compared to its competition from Intel. When compared to AMD's older Ryzen 7 3700X, it comes in at a similar price but consumes a much higher amount of power while offering comparable performance as the 7 nanometer based chip. When compared to the newer Ryzen 5000 line, this chip also falls behind in terms of efficiency and also performance. However, the pricing for said chips on AMD's current generation lineup are much higher than the 9900K. If you're looking for one of these i9 processors, I'd recommend to look on the used market and pairing it with a Z390 motherboard both of which should allow you to save some money, especially since Z390 motherboards have come down in price in the recent months. It'll make for a killer setup, at least for the rest of this console generation, and will allow you to play all your favorite games at 120Hz and beyond. Keep an eye out for one of these chips because it's a beast just waiting to be tamed.